Hello to everyone and welcome to another Marina Generic video by Adventure Store Channel. Today guys you will see this amazing video from Varzilla which is very very informative, have a lot of overhaulings, a lot of service uh, guides which will be shown by video. This video is a little bit long but it will be very nice for someone if they have the same type of engine and I would like to thank you and also I would like to ask you here before the video starts if you like like this type of videos to be shown in this channel but for sure I am sure that you will like them and I would like to inform you also that this video will be separate in two parts, part 1 and part 2, because it's very very long. It's about one hour the first video and one hour also another video. The contain of this video will be completely overhauling of Varzilla ASW38, okay? That will be the engine. And I'd like to share you also with you that I have some small experience in this kind of engine and I'd like to tell that really this is uh, something good that I have seen. The engine is designed very very nice and the only thing it's neat that the maintenance must be done properly in all stages. So. We will can be sure that all requirements of manufacture through the service manual that we have on board will be followed and the job will be done completely and good. Okay. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned to the Story channel. I await your comments about this video and the next videos and the previous videos about the purifier if you like them. Thank you and stay tuned. This is a demonstration video of the SW38 four-stroke medium speed diesel engine in which the dismantling and mounting procedures of the main components are presented. Please note that this video is only informative and that the exact procedures and data are defined in the instruction manual. Before you start with maintenance work, please take care of the following security measures. Close the starting air stop valve. Before dismantling, check that all pipe systems concerned are drained or pressure released. Engage the turning gear. Open the indicator cocks. This is a look at the necessary special tools for the dismantling of the cylinder head. Carrier with jacks, lifting tool, protecting ring, torque wrench and pneumatic hydraulic pump. Start by dismantling the cooling water discharge pipe before removing the cylinder head cover. This is in order to prevent a mixture of the draining water with lubricating oil. Subsequently remove the cylinder head cover. Turn the cylinder in question in top dead center combustion and check if the push rods are loose. Disconnect the plug of the exhaust valve temperature monitoring system.
Now carefully remove the thermocouple of the exhaust temperature system. Take care not to distort the thermocouple while pulling it out. In order to remove the upper half of the clamping ring of the exhaust gas piping, four socket head screws have to be loosened and removed. Next to the connection of the exhaust piping, the inlet air bend is located. Here only four bolts have to be removed. We continue with dismantling at the operating side of the engine. Begin with removing the high pressure fuel line. First, remove the fuel drain pipe of the high pressure fuel line. After that, unscrew the union nuts from the pump and the injector. Now remove the remaining pipes to and from the cylinder head. First, fuel leakage pipe. Second, the main lube oil supply pipe. And third, the pilot air pipe. Immediately after removal of these pipes, all openings should be covered. Before placing the hydraulic stretching tools, Make sure that the screw thread of the cylinder head studs are undamaged and clean. Connect the hydraulic stretching tools with the pump by means of the high pressure hoses. Only two jacks are connected because the other two jacks are linked up. After connecting the hoses, check if the jacks are in bottom position. Then, the jacks are turned back one turn. Close the return valve on the pump. Set the prescribed hydraulic pressure as specified in the instruction manual by means of the reducing valve. The read-off value on the air pressure gauge indicates 10% more pressure than the real value read off on the oil pressure gauge. This has been done for safety reasons. Start the hydraulic pump by opening the air supply valve. At the same time, check at what pressure the nuts come loose. Turn back the nuts with a special pin and lower the hydraulic pressure. In case it is not possible to turn the nuts when the prescribed pressure has been reached, one needs to check with a feeler gauge if the nut is free from the surface. Disconnect the hoses, remove the jacks from the studs and check if the nuts are loose. In order to prevent damaging of the removed cylinder head nuts, it is recommended to turn them on the studs of the nearest cylinder head. Subsequently, place the special lifting tool. For this purpose, three M16 threaded holes are provided in the cylinder head. Lift the cylinder head a bit so that the possible leaking water will flow to the outside of the cylinder liner. Pull the push rod protecting pipes out of the cylinder head, in case they stick inside. Check if the starting air connecting pipe stays in its place. Hold 
both the push rods until the cylinder head has been completely removed. This is in order to avoid possible damage. Take away the O-ring and place the distance ring. This protecting ring prevents the gas sealing face from damaging when the cylinder head is placed directly on the floor. Remove both the push rods and the protecting pipes. Close the openings in the engine block to prevent dirt entering the camshaft space. Finally, remove the gas sealing ring and cover the cylinder liner. These are the special tools required for disassembly and assembly of the piston with connecting rod. All these tools come standard with the engine. To prevent carbon buildup on the piston crown, the cylinder liner accommodates an anti-polishing ring. Remove this ring before pulling out the piston. To do so, use a tripod extractor which can be fitted in three special grooves of the anti-polishing ring. First, try to tap the ring out of the liner using a plastic hammer. If the ring is stuck, it can be pressed out gently by turning the piston to the top dead center. When the piston is in the top dead center, the ring can be removed from the liner. Tap the two M16 threaded holes so that the lifting tool can be fitted. The cylinder liner must be free from carbon to protect the piston rings during removal of the piston. When the lifting tool has been provided, the piston can be turned to the bottom dead centre. Remove on both sides of the engine the crankcase doors. Fit the jacks on either side of the connecting rod foot when the piston has reached the bottom dead centre. To allow all four studs to be stretched simultaneously, three superposed jacking elements, so-called triple jacks, are used, which jointly provide the required tensile force. Note, the distance piece is provided with a pin groove at the front. Two nuts are used to secure the three triple jacks. Each jacking element comes with a separate coupling for oil supply hoses. When the hoses have been connected to the pneumatic pump, tighten the nuts with the hook spanner to prevent the jacks reaching their maximum stroke. Loosen the pulling pieces three quarters of a turn using an Allen key to prevent the connecting rod nuts from getting stuck when they are loosened. Loosen the knurled jack nuts three quarters of a turn from the bottom position. Now gradually pressurize the jacks using the pneumatic pump. When doing so, check the moment at which the nuts come loose and then slack off the nut as specified. Slowly open the return valve of the pump to release the pressure in the jacks.
Check that the nuts stay loose. Remove the jacks and the connecting rod nuts. The piston with connecting rod can now be lifted from the bearing caps. Fit a plastic protecting plate to the bottom of the connecting rod foot to prevent the cylinder liner from being damaged and do this before the end penetrates the cylinder liner. Now the piston with connecting rod can be lifted out of the cylinder liner. Place the piston on a piston pedestal with the piston pressure side supported on a flat wooden base. Finally, remove the intermediate plate from the big end bearing block. Seal the lube oil supply ducts in the bearing block and secure fixing tools to the bearing caps if turning is required. Here's a look at the necessary special tools needed for dismantling and mounting the big end bearing caps. All of these tools are delivered standard with the engine. Turn the crank of the particular cylinder in bottom dead centre position. This is the best position to place hydraulic jacks. Now turn the bearing cap upside down until the stud bolt nuts point vertically upwards. Then place both the jacks on the stud bolts at the same time so that the weight of the jacks is divided uniformly and the caps remain in balance. Since all four of the stud bolts have to be stretched simultaneously, three jack elements are used so that together they deliver the tensile force needed. Note, this distance piece is provided with the pin groove at the side. Every jack element has a separate coupling for oil supply. As soon as the jacks are connected to the hydraulic pump, the nuts of the jacks are turned tight with a hook spanner. This is in order to prevent the jack reaching its maximum stroke. Then turn back the four nuts half a turn. Bring the jacks under the right pressure with the pneumatic pump. Check at which pressure the nuts come loose and turn back the nuts sufficiently. Subsequently lower the pressure to 50 bar and check if the nuts are free. When they are, release the pressure completely. Remove the jacks and turn the relevant crank in top dead centre position. When turning, be sure that the bolts of the bearing block point downward to prevent them from getting stuck in the engine block. To place the slide, the bearing block has to rotate 90 degrees around the shaft so that the nuts from the lower bearing cap point to the exhaust side of the engine. Subsequently fix the slide to the purpose fitted supports on both sides of the engine block. The supports take care of the positioning and securing of the slide. Now turn the crank carefully 60 degrees through top dead center towards the exhaust side. Place at camshaft side the carrier under the upper bearing cap. Connect it with the two nuts to the bearing cap. Yep. 
Now first remove at exhaust side the two lower nuts of the bearing cap in such a way that the second carrier can be mounted. Pull up the blocking pin when the carriers are moved inside. Fasten the carrier of the lower bearing cap by turning on the blocking pin in the locating hole at one side of the cap. During mounting of these carriers it is possible and sometimes necessary to turn the crankshaft a little bit. Always do this with the manual control of the turning gear device. When also the upper nuts have been removed, both the bearing caps can be pulled out. The bearing shells can be removed from the bearing caps by hand. Wrap up the shaft with a piece of rubber for protection and closing of the lubrication oil channels in the crankshaft. The crank pin bearings can also be inspected without removing the cylinder head and the piston. The piston will be blocked then by means of two supports. These are the aluminium supports with matching fastening bolts. They are both placed through the crankcase door and mounted at the bottom side of the cylinder liner with the delivered bolts. To do so, the piston has to be placed in top position. Subsequently, remove the already loosened nuts of the connecting rod foot. After that, turn the crank to the bottom dead centre position. Now the piston with connecting rod will rest on both supports and the bearing caps will come free from the connecting rod foot. When the crank is in bottom dead centre, the big end bearing caps can be dismantled in accordance with the preceding procedure. Mounting has to be done in reversed order. Here are shown the special tools needed for the cylinder liner. Lifting gear, positioning clip, bridge piece and jacks. These tools come standard with the engine. Before the cylinder liner can be removed, three temperature sensors must be taken out from the liner. Be sure not to bend the sensor when taking it out. Now remove the two cylinder liner clamp pieces which prevent the liner from being lifted when the cylinder head or piston is being removed. Now place the hoisting tool in the cylinder liner in transverse direction of the engine. Make sure that the tool is perfectly centred in the liner. To detach the cylinder liner from the joint faces, loosen it with two jacks. Turn the crank of the relevant cylinder to the bottom position so that the counterweights are located straight under the cylinder liner. The bridge piece and jacks are placed on top of both counterweights. Connect the jacks to the pneumatic pump and pressurise the jacks to push the liner out. Gradually increase the hydraulic pressure by turning down the air pressure reducing valve on the pump. When the liner is loose from the sealing surface, it can be lifted out of the engine.
Now clean the ceiling face of the cylinder liner well and check it for any damage. If necessary, the ceiling face can be slightly lapped with a lapping ring. Finally, remove both O-rings from the cylinder liner and clean the grooves if necessary. This is a look at the tools required for disassembly and assembly of the main bearing. All these tools come standard with the engine. Never remove two main bearings mounted side by side at the same time. First loosen both side studs. Standard, one jack for this purpose is available. If two jacks are delivered, then simultaneously mount the jacks on both side studs of the relevant main bearing. Connect the hydraulic hoses and then first tighten the jack as far as possible. Then slack off the jack one full turn. The jacks are so designed that they can be connected in series. Set the prescribed hydraulic pressure using the air pressure reducing valve on the pump and pressurize the jacks as required simultaneously. Note down at which pressure the nuts come loose. The prescribed procedure is stated in the instruction manual. Remove the nuts on either side. The engine is equipped with a bearing monitoring device. A sensor is fitted on each main bearing cap. The sensor can be detached by disconnecting the banjo union. This must be done before the main bearing cap is loosened by jacking. A trolley placed on the rails in the oil sump is used to position the jacks of the main bearing cap under the studs. Place the long stroke jack in the trolley with the rotary disc pointing upwards. Now the main bearing jack can be placed on the rotary disc using the jack hoist mounted at the side of the engine block. In this way, the jack can be easily moved until it is straight under the stud of the main bearing cap. Then couple the long stroke jack to a hand pump to lift up the main bearing jack. This is done to allow the jack to be screwed on the stud thread in an easy way. Now turn up the jack until it contacts the main bearing cap. Repeat this procedure for the second jack. Loosen off the jacks one turn. Connect the jacks to the pneumatic pump. Pressurize both jacks as specified in the instruction manual and simultaneously check when the nuts come loose. Slack off the nuts of the main bearing studs one full turn. When the nuts are loose, the long stroke jack is raised to take up the main bearing jack when it becomes free from the stud.
Now drop the oil pressure, which makes the jack go down as well and can be lifted from the crankcase using the jack hoist. Mount the hydraulic couplings on the low-pressure telescopic jack under the main bearing cap, which also serves as the main lube oil supply line when the engine is in operation. There are two connections on the telescopic jack, which are marked up and down. Connect the delivery side of the hand pump to the down connection, black hose, and the oil discharge hose, blue, to the up connection. Keep the valve in the return oil line closed. Pressurise the telescopic jack slightly so that first both side studs can be removed. Now remove the two main bearing cap nuts. Keep the return valve on the pump closed. Next, the return valve on the pump can be opened, after which the bearing cap can be forced down in a controlled manner. When the telescopic jack has reached its second stage, the cap will be lowered by its own weight. When the cap is in its bottommost position, the lower bearing shell can be taken out manually. Disassemble the upper bearing shell using a turning plate. This plate is placed in the lube oil duct of the crankshaft and secured with an Allen key. Gently turn the crankshaft so that the upper bearing shell is pushed out of the crankshaft bore. To prevent damage, collect the bearing shell when the whole shell has been pressed out of the bore. Before the installation of the main bearing is started, the shaft journal must have been checked for any damage and cleaned. When the upper bearing shell is mounted, the running face must be lubricated with clean engine lube oil. The back side of the bearing shell must be clean and dry. Position the upper bearing shell in longitudinal direction of the engine using a positioning lip local to the lube oil duct. Make sure that the numbers of the bearing point towards the driving end of the engine. Try to push the bearing shell as far as possible by hand. Now the bearing shell can be turned in place using the turning plate. Use the manual device of the turning gear to divide the bearing on either side. Remove the turning plate and clean the main bearing cap well. Now place the lower bearing shell in the main bearing cap and make sure that the back side is clean and dry. Make sure that the bearing positioning lip falls into the main bearing cap recess. The lower bearing can then be fitted in one position only. Equalize the bearing joint faces with the joint faces of the main bearing cap and apply a layer of clean engine oil to the running face of the lower shell. Exchange the connections on the telescopic jack so that the main bearing cap can be jacked up. Now the oil delivery hose is linked to the up connection and the oil return hose to the down connection. Now lift the bearing block using the special hand pump. This pump has an internal protection device limiting the pump pressure to 150 bar to protect the telescopic jack. When the bearing block is pressed against the joint faces, 
the nuts can be fitted. Hand tighten the nuts using the special pin. After the nuts have been fitted, the telescopic jack can be disconnected from the hand pump. Place new O-rings on both side studs and lubricate the O-rings with the prescribed grease. Now screw both studs into the bearing cap. Now slack off the stud a quarter of a turn. First provide the stud with a nut on engine exhaust side only because this stud is pre-tensioned first. This is done to align the bore of the main bearing. Mount the jack on exhaust side. Connect the jack to the pump and check that the jack is in bottom position. Pressurize the jack to 200 bar and tighten the nut. Now the main bearing cap studs can be tightened. To do so, provide the jacks as explained earlier for the disassembly procedure. During assembly, the jack need not be turned back. It can be connected directly to the pump. Now the jacks can be pressurized as required. Count the number of holes when turning the nuts. The number of turns must be approximately the same for all nuts. Now depressurize. Retighten the jacks again and try to turn the nut further. Finally check for a third time to make sure the nuts do not turn any further. Now remove the complete set of hydraulic tools from the crankcase. To prevent stress in the exhaust side stud, it must first be loosened. After the stud has been loosened, the exhaust side stud can be pressurized as required and the nut can be tightened. When this is done three times, then the stud at operating side can be tightened as well. The complete hydraulic tightening procedure is shown at operating side. Next, pressurize the stud at operating side as required and tighten the nut. Allow the pressure to drop. Then re-tighten the jack as far as possible. Now fully pressurize the jack once again and re-tighten the screw as far as possible. After the pressure is dropped, it can be raised again immediately. What? 
When the jack is pressurised for the third time, the nut is not allowed to turn any further. Finally, mount the thermocouple and check the bearing clearance and make sure no loose items are left behind in the engine. To prepare the cylinder liner for assembly, the sealing face must be clean and undamaged. After cleaning the o-ring grooves, always fit new o-rings to seal the engine cooling water space. Lubricate the o-rings with a prescribed grease to keep them in good condition. Properly clean the sealing edge on the engine block and check this surface for damage. If necessary, the edge can be slightly lapped using a special lapping ring. Also remove dirt and or corrosion from the central bore using abrasive paper and check for any damage. At the very least, cover the lube oil ducts in the big end bearing cap during this cleaning job. It is recommended, however, to cover the complete bearing block. Now the liner can be installed. Lubricate the liner edge with a prescribed Loctite for joint face sealing. Since the liner edge is lubricated, any dirt trapped on the sealing edge of the cylinder block can easily be removed because this edge is a dry surface. Lower the cylinder liner slowly into the engine block. Fit the positioning tools before the liner falls into its bottommost guide rim. Place the positioning tools between the two frontmost cylinder head studs. The two positioning pins then fall into two cooling water channels of the cylinder liner. Make sure that the mark M above the frontmost sensor hole is 39 degrees out of the center and that it points in the direction of the fuel pump. This position is also marked on the positioning tools. Guide the tools by hand when lowering the cylinder liner. Finally, proceed as follows. Remove the tools. Fit both clamp pieces and thermocouples. Close the liner with a cover if the piston is not mounted immediately. Place, if necessary, the slide and turn the crank 60 degrees through top dead centre toward the exhaust side. Use the manual control of the turning gear device to bring the crankshaft into the correct position. Remove the piece of rubber from the crank pin. Check the shaft on damage. Clean the shaft thoroughly and check if the lubrication oil canals are clean. Start with mounting the upper bearing shell. This is the shell without the lubricating oil supply groove. Oil the bearing surface with clean engine lubricating oil. The back surface needs to be clean and oil free. Before the bearing shell is mounted, the bore and joint faces of the cap must be checked for damage. Make sure that the positioning lip of the bearing fits into the appropriate recess in the cap. Then, divide the shell proportionally over the joint faces of the cap. Move the upper bearing cap against the shaft. Then, oil the lower bearing shell. This one can be recognised by the uninterrupted lubricating oil groove. Repeat the preceding procedure. Check before both caps are moved against each other if the position of the dowel pins from the joint faces are correct. The bearing caps are marked with camshaft side. Now apply the upper two nuts. Turn them by hand as far as possible with a special pin 
Subsequently, remove both carriers and apply the two remaining nuts. Turn the crank in top position and remove the slide. To pump the bearing caps tight, the crank should be turned into bottom dead centre position. While doing this, guide the bearing block to prevent getting it stuck in the engine. Place the hydraulic tools again proportionally on both sides. After connecting the hydraulic hoses, turn the knurled jack nuts down. Subsequently, bring the jacks simultaneously to full pressure. Tighten the nuts with a special pin and check if all four nuts have the same displacement. Release the hydraulic pressure on the jacks until zero. Completely tighten the knurled nuts of the jacks again. Bring for the second time the prescribed pressure to the jacks and tighten the nuts further if possible. Repeat the procedure once again. When the jacks are brought under pressure for the third time, the nuts should not turn any further. Check the oil clearance of the bearing with feeler gauges. Turn the crank of the relevant cylinder to the bottom dead centre and clean the cylinder liner before the piston is installed. Provide the guide ring on the top side of the cylinder liner to guide the piston rings into the liner. Divide the gaps of the piston rings above the gudgeon pin at an angle of 180 degrees in relation to each other. Apply a proper layer of clean engine oil to the piston rings so that the piston can be mounted smoothly in the liner. Fit the clamp around the piston crown. The piston rings are already forced into their grooves when the clamp is closed. On one side, the connecting rod is marked camshaft side. This marking corresponds with the marked position on the big end bearing block. Carefully lower the piston into the liner with the marking camshaft side pointing towards the camshaft side. Now apply a layer of clean lube oil to the piston skirt. Fit the intermediate plate to the connecting big end bearing caps. Make sure that the plate is clean and undamaged when it is fitted. Next, continue lowering the piston. Check that the piston rings slide smoothly into the liner. When the connecting rod has been lowered far enough, remove the plastic protection plate from the connecting rod foot. Check that the connecting rod foot is clean and guide it carefully over the studs.
Disconnect the crane and remove the lifting tool, clamp and guide ring. Now provide the jacks on either side of the connecting rod foot. After the jacks have been connected to the pump, re-tighten the nuts of the jacks with the hook spanner to bring the jacks in bottom-most position. Connect the second set of jacks using an oil distributing block and subsequently fully pressurise the jacks simultaneously. When this pressure has been reached, the nuts can be tightened with a special pin. Check the displacement by counting the number of holes, which must be the same for all nuts. Then, slowly drop the pressure by opening the return valve. When the jacks are completely pressureless, tighten the jack nuts as far as possible and fully pressurise the jacks for the second time. Next, tighten the connecting rod nuts further, if possible. Depressurize and immediately afterwards pressurize the jacks for the third time for verification. This time the nuts should not turn any further. Now remove the hydraulic tools. Remove the carbon deposits on the inside and outside of the anti-polishing ring and place the ring in the liner using the tripod. When mounting a cylinder head, always use a new steel gas sealing ring. The gas sealing faces of both the cylinder liner and the cylinder head must be in good condition. Otherwise, lap them slightly with a lapping ring. Clean the push rod sealing rings thoroughly and grease them with the required silicone grease, which keeps the rubber in good condition. Subsequently, place the push rod protecting pipes. Check the push rods for damage and mount them with the venting hole pointing upwards. Fit a new rubber sealing ring on the flange of the inlet air bend and grease it with the prescribed lubricant. Also on the connection pipe for the starting air, a new sealing ring is fitted and greased with a prescribed lubricant. Now the new cooling water sealing ring around the cylinder head is fitted and greased. Finally, both the rubber sealing rings of the push rods in the cylinder head are being renewed and greased. Turn the cylinder in combustion top position so that the inlet and the exhaust push rods are placed on the base circles of the cams. Now cautiously lower down the cylinder head over the cylinder head stud bolts and guide both push rods down through the passages in the cylinder head. The push rod protecting pipes need to be guided as well until they fit properly in the cylinder head. 
Make sure that the cylinder head will also slide easily over the starting air connection pipe. By the oblique position of the inlet and exhaust flanges, the cylinder head automatically takes its position. Make sure that the exhaust flange on the cylinder head fits in the lower clamping piece. Clean the surface of the cylinder head and the nuts thoroughly and check for damage before the nuts are being applied. Fit the hydraulic stretching tools again. Then tighten the jacks completely and connect the hoses. The return valve on the pump should be opened. After that it is necessary to check if the jacks can be turned any further. This is to be absolutely sure that the jacks are in bottom position and that there is a maximum stroke available. Bring simultaneously the jacks under pressure as prescribed in the engine instruction manual. Tighten the nuts completely and check the nut displacement by counting the number of holes that should be the same for every nut. Fully release the pressure and turn down the jacks as far as possible. After that, bring the jacks for the second time under full pressure. Try to turn the nut farther. Repeat this procedure as a checkup. Make sure the nuts do not turn any farther. After that, remove the stretching tools. You can start, for example, with mounting at the exhaust side. For this purpose, grease first the inside of the upper exhaust clamping ring with a heat-resistant lubricant. Subsequently, place the clamping ring over the exhaust flange and mount it with the four socket head screws. Treat the screw thread of these bolts also with a heat-resistant lubricant as specified in the instruction manual. Then, these socket head screws are tightened to a specific torque. This torque wrench is a standard delivered tool with the engine. Use a new gasket when the cooling water discharge pipe is mounted. The bolts of the rubber clamping piece are also tightened to a specific torque. Successively, the pilot starting air pipe, lubrication oil supply pipe and the central drain pipe can be mounted at operating side. Remove the protecting cap of the fuel pressure insert in order to mount the high pressure fuel line. First, tighten the union nut of the high pressure fuel line in the connection to the fuel pump and after that, the union nut on the insert. Both union nuts of the high pressure fuel line are tightened to a specific torque. First, tighten the union nut on the fuel pump. After that, the union nut of the insert from the cylinder head. Subsequently, the fuel drain pipe is connected. Finally, the sealing flange on the cylinder head is tightened. Check if, at operating side of the cylinder head, no parts or tools are left behind. After that, the panels of the hotbox can be mounted. Subsequently, the valve clearance has to be adjusted. However, for this purpose, the yoke has to be adjusted first in such a way that the clearance at both valves are equal. Consult the instruction manual for the correct procedure. Equal adjustment of the yoke can be achieved with the adjusting bolt of the yoke.
After adjustment, the locking nut of the adjusting bolt is tightened to a specific torque. During tightening, the adjusting bolts as well as the yoke need to be held tight. Otherwise, there is a chance that the bolt will break from the guide block. The valve clearance is adjusted with the adjusting bolt in the rocker arm. A feeler gauge of the correct size is placed between the yoke and the pivot. Hereafter, the adjusting bolt is tightened until the push rod jams. This can be checked by turning the push rod by hand. Tighten the locking nut to the correct torque. Take care that during tightening of the locking nut, the adjusting bolt does not turn any further by holding it tight with a spanner. Finally, the clearance between the yoke and the guide block have to be checked with a feeler gauge. Now mount the thermocouple for the temperature of the exhaust gases and connect the plug of the exhaust valve temperature monitoring system. Finally, place the cylinder head cover. Before closing, it is wise to make a final check of the lubrication points and cooling water in and around the cylinder head.